like to introduce Jonathan Mandel. His mosaics are in permanent display at the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia, Dickinson College, the University of Pennsylvania, the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, Citizens Bank Park, the McGraw-Hill Company in New York, Drexel University, the Nemours DuPont Hospital in Wilmington, and the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center in Skokie, Illinois, amongst many other sites in the country. Additionally, Jonathan has served as an adjunct professor at Drexel University's Westfall College of Media Arts, where he has taught his fine art approach to mosaic. His mosaics have been featured in the Bel Air Hotel Magazine, Glass Art Magazine, and the Penn Gazette and Northwestern Magazine. Jonathan's talent lies in the implementation of fundamental fine art concerns such as perspective, color composition, and drawing into the medium of mosaics. Utilizing such materials as hand-blown glass shards, ceramic tile, semi-precious stones, minerals, mirror, Mandel creates wall-mounted panels and three-dimensional forms, which evolve into tactile paintings and sculptures. His grout lines are designed to act as drawing lines, bringing his imagery to life. These lines establish depth perspective and the volume of form in the composition. The hand-blown glass shards are convex and concave pieces allowing for a bas-relief effect to the form across the mosaic surface. Afterwards, um, we will also share a link. I'll put it on Facebook to share his link to his book and portfolio. And Jonathan also has a spring and summer class that's going to be available at the Mainline Art Center that we'll provide the link to later. So thank you, Jonathan. And um, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thanks. So I figured I'd start just to get into how I came to do Mosaic. And then I'll share with you my PowerPoint of some of the directions I've taken it in through the years. Um, I've been doing this, I counted 32 years. I earned an MFA in 1990 from University of Pennsylvania Graduate School of Design. And there was a professor that I was doing some TA work for whose name was Sewell Silman. And he was basically on the retiring end of his career. He worked in printing for Joseph Albers, his square series. And um, he would come in every week from Lyon, Connecticut, and he would teach two classes, one in drawing and one in color theory. Drawing, the whole point was making a line act. There was no toning or shading or cross hatching. You just created illusions of depth, volume, barkiness, translucency, whatever you could do with a drawing line. And color theory was, uh, are you familiar with color aid paper? It's like a high quality colored paper comes in a pack of like 380 colors. And we'd spend hours cutting and snipping the color aid sheets. And you could make color act by applying different colors against different colors. You could make two different colors appear to be the same color or the same color appear to be different ones and studies in yellow and blah, blah, blah. So I subbed out the cut paper with ceramic and, and kind of fused the two ideas. So my grout lines are acting like drawing lines and in lieu of cut paper, I'm using the tile. And that's how I got to do mosaic. Most of the inspiration for me personally comes from paintings and, and um, I, I try to focus on real building block ideas of color composition, spatial composition, use of line, perspective, narrative, and, and try to have fun with it. And I've done sculpture. Sculpture is my original area of study. And I combined bar relief in with the, the wall panels as well. So I guess with that, I'll, I'll share my screen. If anybody has any questions, feel free. I'll try to buzz through this slide deck, that's me. So this is actually doesn't exist in, in mosaic tile form. This is a mosaic in air quotes uh, drawing. I use Photoshop and I'll import my source material and then on a layer above, have my tiles and then another layer that would be a solid gray grout layer. So I'm designing the tile pieces so that the spaces between them, the grout lines, act like drawing lines and create some sense of, of dimensionality or volume in this case. So I, I sort of lump my work into different categories. Here's a glass shard piece. So the, I don't know if you can see from the photography, but the pieces are convex and concave and it's not a flat surface. 
and I'm bumping out of the square. Uh, let's see. It's another one, landscape meandering stream. This piece is kind of interesting. I got contacted by somebody, a company in Montreal, Dolcesa, I believe it's pronounced, and they use the image uh, to create a line of women's clothing. It's at the tail end of my PowerPoint. I didn't, would have never thought of that on my own. So there's flowers on Mars, a lot of pattern on pattern. This is a piece I recently installed at the um, uh, Bryn Mawr Hospital, the uh, Breast Health Center. It's um, 66 inch by 33 inches and it's all glass shards. Here's one with extreme amounts of extended uh, glass. So they're all like two inch thick panels. I make the panels using one by fours. I frame it out, then put a piece of quarter inch ply over the top and then a miter cleat uh, on the back and they hang with a miter. So um, I apply the glass and tile onto the quarter inch ply. And then I use a latex stucco, like a dry it kind of material for my grouting. It's more lightweight that can skin coat the return edge. Um, it's flexible. So it all around, um, I, I found to be a good system. I can chisel out areas and, and um, mod modify them and, and reapply the grout and there's no watermark. Here's one where I have four separate panels that are all connected by a tree overlay form. Uh, each panel is maybe, I'm gonna guess around 33 by 22 inches. That's pretty cool. Here's one, thank you, which has a lot of sculpture bar relief quality. The shelf at the bottom, the perpendicular shelf comes out about eight inches from the mosaic surface. And then the vase, the taller one and the, the, the shorter one are, are both raised. The taller one has six fully sculptural flowers that insert into the taller vase, a series of, of pipes going into tubes. Here's another example of it, two shelves, six flowers. This has a fun little element. There's a, a painting on the rear wall. I was experimenting with having decals made of my mosaic images and then them fired on the ceramic. So the painting is actually a detail of a bar scene that I did many years ago, um, put into the, the composition. This one, it's hard to really tell from this picture, but the three flowers actually protrude from the surface about 14 inches. They come way out. It's really almost like cartoonish. The mosaic wraps around the side edge, the framing, and these flowers also insert uh, into the tubes um, that emanate from the surface. This is about three foot by two foot by 14. Here's another one doing the same thing with gladiolus. These five gladiolus stalks insert into the mosaic. You can see the, the drawing lines are creating the illusion of translucency with the water and the volume of the vase. Here's one with glass shards where I'm using figurative element. Another one in that vein. Okay. Thank you, it's three foot by two foot. I, I tend to make my pieces for the most part pretty upbeat and, and um, feel. I've always been of the belief that um, real beauty is a farther reach than pain. I think pain is so commonplace, anybody can, can offer an expression of pain. This one is uh, Nisqually one is four foot by four foot. The sky is snowflake obsidian, natural volcanic glass. And the bottom two thirds are, are man-made glass shards. The figure sort of Gauguin-esque. It's about a half dozen varieties of marble. And then there's spheres in the sky in the upper left. They're rhodonite, labradorite, and agate and the jasper. And then the vessel to the side of the figure there's a one inch hole in the mouth of the vessel. And if you peer into it, there's a bed of amethyst. The glass shards are from Jehuli studio. There was actually an earthquake out that way in 2002. So I contacted glass artists thinking glass could have been broken in an earthquake and raised money for Surf Craft Artists Emergency Relief Fund. There's another one that's four foot. 
sea urchins and blue lace agate and blown glass. Here I'm combining the ceramic tile with the glass. So with the ceramic tile, I do like high detail. And then the glass is more about color and movement. So I've created the deer and then the universe in which the deer exists with the glass. Here's one of a chimpanzee, uh, alpaca. This one, the client had all these, like five dogs and she was like a dog whisperer. She'd clap her hands and they'd hop on the wrought iron and she had a stack of photos and I, I created this from, from that. It's like 33 by 33, I think. Two dogs of water. I like to do a lot playing with reflection. I think that's a lot of fun. Little tweezer sized pieces to fill in the shadows of the nostrils or the eyes. A lot of little bitty pieces, a fraction of the size of your pinky nail. Pitbull. Here's an art museum gallery. So this is three foot by three foot. I like to tinker a lot with perspective and be playful with it, and create narrative. The paintings on the walls are different stones and minerals. So you can see a, um, a uh, mobile, coming up, mobile coming off the ceiling. And then the abstracted hand sculpture that's there, it was uh, actually a, a piece I did when I was doing my MFA, it was a plaster study. So I figured it was my big opportunity to get in an art museum gallery. So I popped it in my composition. And the walls on the, the paintings on the walls are different stones and minerals. But I like the idea that the composition kind of continues past like the, the olive green wall, you kind of use your imagination to flesh it out. I like to kind of do that where it's enough information along the perimeter and then you engage the viewer to, to flush it out. This is six foot by four foot. Klein had me do a rendering of the west wall of the great room of the Barnes Foundation. So I had to try to make it look like 30 of these post-impressionist masterworks and Dr. Barnes is in the middle. And again, the grout lines create that illusion of depth and I'm sort of playing with it, moving it in different perspectives. If you'd ever been to the Marion Barnes, which is what this is, they never had the windows open. That's just sort of my take on it. They always draped closed, I guess, to protect the art. You can see the dance, Matisse's dance in the upper left. Here's what I was commissioned to do with the opposite wall, the east wall. This family wanted themselves in the gallery. So Beatles on the Ed Sullivan Show. This is 32 by 32. It's a little bitty that the faces are maybe about a little more than an inch from top to bottom. So I'm tweezering in little bitty nostrils and eyebrows and lips and trying to make it look like to some degree the Beatles. And you see them on the black and white on the TV monitor screen. So I'm trying to create this sense of motion with the audience as well, like they're dancing. And there's Ed on the side, Ed Sullivan. Here's one that's 36 by 36. So I, this is actually based on a mosaic drawing and then I, I telegraphed the lines onto the panel using carbon paper. All the liquor bottles are different, semi-precious stones and minerals. There's probably about 70 different materials in this piece and trying to capture the motion of the orchestra and, and people dancing and whatnot. Uh, here's the bar scene that I drew from in that original piece where I said the artwork on the wall. Um, it was a detail from this. So the people in the bar are in a perspective, but the floor is completely flattened out. So the floor becomes the atmosphere, like a Saturday night fever, pulsating color kind of thing. I learned that tumbled rose quartz is really good for rendering cosmopolitans. Here's another one. This is like 32 by 32. Um, client wanted me to do Newport, Rhode Island. Um, he wanted indoor, outdoor. He wanted a gay bar. He wanted, he had like a whole punch list a DJ and it kind of went through his punch list and I made a mosaic drawing, which he then approved. And then I did in tile. Uh, here's a um, one I call Mantis Room. So the piano, the pianist and the audience are all raised elements. I used dense foam and then applied it to the surface and mosaic over the foam to create this bar relief quality. Uh, the, the drum kit is um, blue lace, onyx and quartz and brass. And the sheet music is um, zebra marble. And then that, that in the center in the back wall is a detailing of a praying mantis. 
I had actually been commissioned to do a praying mantis for somebody. So it's another piece that's fired onto a tile and applied onto another mosaic. That's how I got the name Mantis Room. There's one also kind of playing with perspective and people dancing and whatnot. This is um, six foot by four foot portrait of the fifth hole at Philadelphia Cricket, Flower Town. I've never played golf, so it was a real learning experience as to where people would be positioned relative to the golfer. And apparently people put down coins to mark balls and stuff like that. And he wanted an autumnal scene. This one's at the ballpark. It's eight foot by six foot. There's actually a print of it behind me. Um, so I wanted to capture the illusion of the depth of the bowl of the arena, kind of using multiple perspectives. The hot dog vendor in the lower right is handing off a hot dog to you, the viewer. I don't know if you can see that with the squiggly mustard. And the fanatic is on top of the dugout and there's a cotton candy vendor and whatnot. The sky is soda light. It's a pretty blue stone. This one's at Laura Marion, portrait of Kobe. So I'm trying to create the illusion of motion and the volume of his torso and arms and um, tension of his fingers on the ball. There's a couple of portraits. These are actually my maternal grandparents. So I imported a photo into Photoshop, made my mosaic drawing, blew it up the scale, transferred the lines. And I married the portraits with a 70s era a background pattern to kind of feed into the narrative. But you can see the beehive quality with her hair and her blouse is glass shard. So that has raised quality to it. You can see the grout line describing the girth of his belly and the little eyes out on his shirt. Another one in that vein. It's a real pain in the butt to cut circles inside of circles using a wet saw. Here he's creating the illusion of his hand compressing her hand. Her dress is glass shards, her earring is a sea urchin. I use the grout line to articulate the um, frill in his shirt, the ruffle in his shirt. Uh, this one is basically 10 foot by seven foot. It's at the um, Heart Pavilion at Lankanal Hospital. It's 33 different individual panels that all mounted together in a particular way. Um, there's in-between panels that separate the images that are glass shards. So the center is, is the campus and then different scenes of, of patrons and doctors and nurses. And I think I'm the first person to do a mosaic rendering of a Da Vinci robotic machine. I don't think that's been done. It was really difficult to get it mounted above the staircase. We had to use a, a scissor lift. This one's at Laura Marion High School. It's 10 foot by six foot. It's on the um, Montgomery Avenue side. What's kind of fun with this is the center is a rendering of the previous high school building. And they had them knock loose brick from the facade, cut that brick down and used it to make the rendering so people could always touch the old school in perpetuity. And then different scenes of academia and sports and whatnot uh, all around it. Um, this is a Jewish theme piece is in the lobby of Adith Israel Synagogue in Marion. So it goes up eight feet across 14 and down eight. There's a built-in mezuzah on the right side. And it, it um, depicts different Jewish holidays around the year. And the glass shards are, are actually a landscape. It's a giant talus or prayer shawl is the idea. And then it has the landscape of Israel. And then the holidays are superimposed on that. Um, in Israel, there's Yad Vashem, which is the Holocaust Museum. And it's actually the view that one sees upon exiting the museum after seeing all the horrible, you know, you see the landscape. This one's at Penn's Hill out, it's 10 foot by six foot timeline history of the Jewish people. It's uh, the landscape is the, the landscape of time and the meandering path is path of Judaism. And it's marked by different icons from Jewish art, whether it's illustrated manuscript, mosaic, architecture, whatnot. This is one in residence. Um, it's a daviner or one that prays. The, the man who's praying is articulated in marble and granite. And most everything else is glass shard and there's amethyst and citrine. And this, there's a light in the sky that's a geode, septarian nodule. 
This is a seven foot by five foot Hamsa. It's uh, made out of glass shards and sodalite and more septarian, different uh, spheres cut in half. Uh, here it is in place with me, minus a beard. There's an example of a sculpture. It's a life-size deer and I jacketed with um, hand-blown glass shards. There's a series of figures. What's challenging with sculpture is with a wall piece, it's on a flat plane, except for if you employ bar relief. But here you've got to circumnavigate the piece and go from A to Z back to A, and it's got to make sense. And it's got to jacket the form. As many of you know, trying to, to jacket a compound form is tricky because at every plane break, you have to cut the tile. Here I am next to, it's a two perpendicular forms that interlock like L shape, and then these flowers insert into the top. I use bits of mirror in with the glass to create the water movement kinetic effect. This is the mainline art center did that dogs around the main line back in 02, dogs unleashed. I was one of the few maniacs that decided to mosaic it rather than paint it. So I did Gustav Klimt's The Kiss in mosaic on a dog. You can see the detail of the man kissing the woman. And I had to invent the rear view of the kiss that doesn't exist because it's two dimensional. So how his arm would travel around her and whatnot. It's about 50 inches tall, four foot two. Um, it's a vessel with glass shards. This is an example of a mosaic drawing. So I could use this to create a mosaic. Here's another example playing with the shadows. That's my wife wearing the dress I was telling you about. And here's an example of a refrigerator with my bar seat, art cooler. And that's my slide deck. Did I get through that quickly enough? That was a beautiful presentation. Well done, thank you. Thank you. We have a, a number of questions. I think very active uh, viewers here. Um, let's see, Alyssa asked if, um, you enjoy gardening. Is that one of your inspirations? Um, I'm not super talented with gardening. Um, basically, it's me pulling weeds. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm a big fan of, of perennials. I don't think I could manage watering annuals. But, you know. um, a lot of people just commenting on, on really how beautiful the work is. I don't know if you can see those comments, Jonathan, but... Oh, uh, no, I yeah, they're really nice. You know, people love the uniqueness, your style. Uh, one question, uh, can you elaborate on your latex grout? Sure. So uh, I don't know if you've ever heard the brand name Drive It, but basically when it's stuck with building, it comes in a five gallon pail, pre-mixed colors, and they have different colors. There's a gray, there's um, tan color. And um, it's water-based, so you can thin it out a little bit. But you would have the mosaic on the panel and then push the grout into the cracks and then wipe away the excess, basically to the point where it's like a thin film. And then that dries and it creates little air bubbles. And then you clean it up and then second coat it and it fills in the bubbles and you skin coat the return edge. And that's basically it. So I use a company called California Stucco. They're based in Hackensack, North Jersey. They actually will FedEx a bucket, but it's not cheap to FedEx. But for me, a buck, a five gallon bucket lasts me a long time. Yeah. You just you know, reclose it. And that's what I use in my class at the Mainline Art Center. I make each student an 18 inch by 18 inch wall mounted panel and then get um, from eBay a bulk thing of Mexican tile. That way I'm not buying a box of green, a box of red, whatever, and it comes with 30 different colors. And I, my primary tool is a wet saw and occasionally I use tile nippers and I'll get a bunch of portable wet saws and um, teach the class. Cool. There's a, a question from Carol uh, Zatuski asking if you can explain the grout and chiseling process. So chiseling is not particularly fun, but um, I, I did one where it was two business partners that did commercial strip malls and they had a falling out. So I had to chisel one of the dudes out and then <laughs> you're not just chiseling them out because you don't want to then have a grout line of his profile. You have to chisel out beyond it and then blend it in. But uh, just 
good old hammer and chisel and pop the things up off of the panel and try not to damage the neighbor pieces. Because it's a latex stucco, you can wet it and take a mat knife and kind of cut around the grout lines and try to gently nudge a piece out. I was saying I'm working on this large scale piece and uh, did I get into that with you or is that beforehand? When I was, anyhow, I'm doing a large scale piece. It's five foot by 30 foot and it's a Bucks County landscape. And I learned the hard way after articulating six feet of, of conifer trees that the trees are deciduous. They lose their leaves basically up in Bucks County. So now I'm taking a hammer and chisel and chiseling out all these pine trees. Mm. Uh, but it's Ow. possible, it just kind of sucks, but you can do it. Yeah. <laughs> so much for the gardening inspiration, right? <laughs> so. Well, for me, well, I, I use a lot of the flower pieces like so in the beginning. Yeah. I view flowers like, almost like posing a figure. To me, there's a yeah. very figurative quality where things have a, like a very not a proud pose or, or a wilty pose. I, I think that there are a lot of parallels between the way flowers can be postured and, and, and figures can be posed. And there's a, a question and follow up to that comment. How did you create the 3D effect with the gladiolas in the vase? So I used PVC pipe, which I, uh, you know, like the metal straps that you can screw down. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's like a half circle with two little flats. So you can secure the PVC on that way and then hot glue it as well and secure the bottom of the PVC so it doesn't travel through and then just get some metal pipe and bend it whichever way you, you want the angle to be. And then it'll insert in and out and then you apply. Doing the gladiolus also is kind of a pain because I had to articulate using a wire each petal and then apply a mosaic to each petal, grout the whole thing, get it to fit nicely. My professor Selman that I talked about in the beginning had this quote, he said, never let them see you sweat, create the, the illusion of effortlessness as though it just came off your hand easily. Like you don't want it to look like you struggled to make it happen. Yeah. And I, I believe in that. Um, but, there's a, oh, go ahead, sorry. I, I like to try to give the viewer as much as possible so in any given piece, I want to have a color composition, a spatial composition, if I can tinker with perspective, if I can give a narrative. I enjoy non-representational art, but personally, I, I feel like I'm compelled to be a storyteller. I want to give something additional, that extra layer. You could turn it upside down and it could be a color composition just as well without the narrative. But I, I just personally take um, pleasure in, in storytelling. Um, so you're getting a lot of wow on the Barnes pieces. Oh, thank you. Um, a question about whether the Beatles piece was for a fundraiser and how amazing that is. So I actually did two Beatles pieces. I didn't show, I, there's a bunch of stuff because I've been doing this 30 plus years that I, I did not include because of time. And I would suggest if you want to do a deeper dive, go to my website. But I did the Beatles at Sullivan and then the Beatles rooftop concert. I don't know if you guys are familiar. It was the last concert they did on top of their studio in January in London. So they were kind of like bookend pieces. I sold them both through the National Liberty Museum. Every year they do a glass auction and um, I participate nice. in that. Nice. Um, more, uh, you know, wows, truly marvelous, one person says. Um, Muse of my soul, uh, that deer is amazing. Thank what you. is the uh, substrate and, and also the size uh, on the Barnes piece? I guess there were- The, there the substrate of the deer pieces. is a life-size deer. I had this light bulb moment one time driving home from the Jersey Shore, I was leaving from, from Ventnor to get on the AC Expressway. And there's that T where you're at the end of the road and you make the left and it puts you on the expressway, that shore road, whatever it's called. And there was this big plastic deer and I had a light bulb moment, taxidermy. Go <laughs> to taxidermy websites, they have these foam. In the case of the deer, they literally saw it in half, front, half and back and you reassemble it. And there's threaded rods that come out the hooves and I made a base, you run the threaded rods through drill holes and then oh. secure the washer and a nut on the underside. But it's really not outdoor worthy like, I, that's a quick, funny story. If I have time, I did this Liberty Museum thing and I was auctioning off a life-size deer. And in front of like six, 700 people, the woman running it announces it's indoor, outdoor when it wasn't. 
And there's all this bedding. And I must have had three different deers that people put outside and I had to go repair them with freeze and thaw issues. I had one where I saw the couple at the event. How's your deer? It's great. And the next day I got an SOS call that a buck attempted to mount the deer and snap the tail, clean off the sculpture. I had to go reapply the tail. That was pretty funny. That's hilarious. That's great. But taxidermy is a good source uh, for forms. Uh, that's a cool. That's cool. Um, absolutely. I'm just reading what people are saying. Truly marvelous. Absolutely beautiful work. The wonderfully recognizable style. I'm in awe of your mastery of perspective. Um, when you use dense foam to raise the tile, do you still use the latex stucco? Yeah, so the stucco is, is after I apply the, the tile. That's the grouting. So that's the final step. Um, so it's just a nice system because A, it's lightweight. B, it's flexible. I've done pieces where the wood is warped a little over time and you can I don't know if you know the expression towing a screw, but you, you angle it through the wood and then you can tighten it up against the wall if need be. I've had to do that with larger public pieces. And they can only be removed off the wall if you lift up about an inch to get it up off of the cleat. So um, yeah, and then I was saying that you can reapply it later without a watermark. And it's not brittle like cement, so you can skin coat the return edge and it won't chip off so much. So basically it's the weight of the tile. The glass is heavier than the tile because it's thicker and I have to really blob on a lot of glue to get them. You have to get them to angle into each other so that the surface rolls and there isn't like big points that pop up. So yeah. that's a little bit of a trick to get the convexities to roll into one another. But you can have a rolling landscape or the roll of a shoulder into a torso articulated by the convexity of the glass. But I like to combine the materials because each has its strength with the tile, I can do the bitty detail stuff and with the glass color and movement. Um, is it, were you gonna tell us the size on this one? Oh, I'm sorry. The, the Barnes one you were asking me is size six foot by four foot. Wow. So even though that's a decent size, it still makes the largest piece maybe four by six or you know something like that, the, the um, Surratt one in the back. And then you have to put them on angles of the ones in the north and south wall to get them to go back in space. Funny story, I um, showed this to the people at the barns and they were all about it, wanted posters and note cards. And then they, I think they figured out it was a rendering of the Marion Barnes and then they pulled all of the merch out of the gift shop. Oh, well. Um, now that was a commission and the other one was also. So yeah. they're in someone's home. Is that right? Yeah. If, if you ever saw the movie Art of the Steel about yeah. the the first one was commissioned by the men that, that produced that. Okay. So he had a real affinity for the barns. Great. Um, are you using any of your handmade blown glass or are you purchasing it from somewhere? Oh, I don't. I should probably by way of, of clarity, I don't know anything about firing tile or I don't know anything about blowing glass. I just get material and, and use it in what I do. So I go around the hot shops and buy broken pieces. eBay is a great resource for lapidary, you can get tumbled and whatever, or slabs of whatever. And um, abalone is a real pretty material to work with, but you really gotta be careful about dust masks. The, the dust is not good for your yeah. lungs yeah. and any of this stuff. A couple of uh, compliments on uh, your website. Um, ah, and then um, one, and thanks Donna for sharing that website. And then um, a question or more like a comment that the, the, the grout lines in uh, the figures are so thin. So a question, just sort of a technical question about how you really like get that in there. Is there a so the grout lines, I vary the thickness. It's kind of like a drawing line. A darker line would be a broader grout line. A tighter joint would be a finer line, depending on how I want to draw attention to it. Um, basically, it's a lot of back and forth with the wet saw, just making little subtle adjustments on each piece, creating that illusion of effortlessness <laughs> that they all nicely fit next to one another. But it's just a lot of back and forth. You probably walk a mile going five feet back and forth. Yeah. It's not too pretty. 
uh, those are the uh, those are the questions that we have today. And then Donna put Jonathan's website down there, and I believe you said um, you're you did mention that you're teaching um, at uh, the Mainline Art Center, both yes. in, now and in the mm -hmm. summer or in the spring. Which it's is starting mid-April. Yeah, all, all the information's on my website. Yeah, and and great, and you can access it that way. But that sounds like a class worth considering. Uh, anything Hello. else? Anybody else have any uh, questions? Feel free to unmute yourself. You don't have to put it in the chat. Jonathan, I just want to thank you. I, I told you when we spoke last week that the first time I saw one of your pieces was in Bryn Mawr at the, the Film Institute, which is the uh, local movie theater. And living in the suburbs, for some reason, I didn't really see mosaics much of anywhere. And yours was the first one that I saw. So when you're in line to get popcorn and you look over to the right, <laughs> you, see, you see his mural. And you said that was a part of a mural, right? No, it's a complete piece. It was in okay. somebody's home. They had a home theater and then they donated it to the Bryn Mawr Film Institute. Wow. They're big Casablanca fans. <laughs> Well, what a great presentation. Thank you so much. Sure, um, my pleasure. Really instructive. And um, yeah, we all learned a lot. Um, it, it's really, what a nice gift to, um, to just hear you think about it and think about your work. So. Yeah, I like to think of these as like tactile paintings. It's the one piece. I, this piece in the Constitution Center before COVID during high season, it would get between two or 3,000 school kids a day and it's en route to the cafeteria. <laughs> and maybe at the end of the week, they windex off the slobber and the peanut butter for the kids, but it, it really doesn't require much in the way of maintenance. Yeah, thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much, John. Thank you. Thank you.